in 1519, he set forth on the final leg of a voyage uh, from Cuba to the Yucatan Peninsula. He had 500 soldiers, 100 sailors, 16 horses, and 11 ships. He was going to take over the greatest treasure in all the world, the greatest treasure the world has ever known. 600 years this treasure had been held by the same people. Johnny probably following along a little bit here, but this has been a history lesson. He was a conqueror. Now, this was not anything unusual back then. It would be like a doctor or a lawyer or a janitor or whatever. They were conquerors back in the day. They went and took over countries. And on this one, he knew that he had to have the most committed people. This was not something that was going to be easily accomplished. So he had to have people that had a commitment that was greater than any other before. So what he did was he talked about that treasure, how this is the greatest treasure your eyes have ever seen. Just think about what you heard. It's probably even greater than what you've heard. You know, so he's talking it up, talking about how, you know, your family is going to be set. You don't have to worry about anything after we go and take this. So they're headed over. And of course, just like probably a lot of Baptists on there, he got a lot of complaining. Well, I'm not so sure I need to be on this boat at this time. I don't know if this is exactly what God's called me to do. You know, they started coming up with good excuses. So when they get there, he gets them, gathers them on the beach again, starts talking up this treasure again. Your kids' kids, I mean, they're, you're set. It's the greatest treasure of all time. Final day comes, we're going to go out to fight, so he huddles them up. You know, he thought this was going to be the, the, everybody thought this was a story, you know, you go here, you go there. If it gets bad, we're going to meet back here and head out. But he gathers them all up and he just says three simple words. He says, burn the boats. And you can imagine our boats, uh, ones we just got here on, you're crazy, man. But he said, burn the boats. He said, if we're going to go home, we're going in their boats. So you can imagine their commitment was exceedingly greater at that point. It was either go home in their boats or die. Right? So, funny thing is, they fought and fought well, and they took over the treasure. Now, this was the story of Hernando Cortez taking over the, the Aztec treasure. Greatest treasure known to man. But yet, I'm here this morning to tell you, even though that was a great treasure, we have a much greater treasure. And not one that we have to conquer, but as Rob read in those verses, words were used like that we have to entrust or protect the one that has been entrusted to us. We have a great treasure. And it is our job to protect it and to proclaim it. So as you're looking at your verses, we're actually going to start in verse 6. We have just heard Rob read about how Timothy had some great, a great mother and a great grandmother that had uh, proclaimed the faith, the gospel, the treasure to him. And so in verse 6, it says, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, that kindle afresh is the same thing of fan the flame. You know, when you get a fire going, and it looks like it starts going out, and you start fanning it and boiling it. That's what this word indicates here. He said, you've been given something, Timothy. And it's something much greater than what you are using it for right now. Not that Timothy was doing anything wrong. It was just to a point where Paul is encouraging him to fan the flame. Now's the time to really go at it. Now, we know 2 Timothy is probably one of the later 
writings of Paul that we have, at least in the canon of scriptures. And Paul's essentially headed to be executed at this time. So he's, this is more of a handing off of, hey, I'm probably about to be gone. You're the one that's going to have to be the crazy one. You're going to have to be the one that's fanning the, fanning the flame that's on fire and going across this land to set it afire, basically. And he reminds me, he says, listen, I know you have this gift. Remember, I have even told you, I've laid hands on you affirming the gift that you have been given from God. And as believers, we all have a gift. We've got a treasure in the gospel and in Jesus Christ. Verse 7, he says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and of discipline. So, many people always take this and say, oh, Timothy was just this shy guy and all that type of stuff. He may have been. But that's not necessarily what he's getting at because this is not a story about Timothy. This is a story about God Almighty. And he says, listen, God doesn't give you a shy spirit. He gives you one of power. And more of power, He gives you one of love. Now, this is not just something to encourage Him to go out and love on people and, and to proclaim the gospel to people, although that is included in it. But he says that this is something that's even greater than that. One of the commentaries I read said, this is the Holy Spirit also produces a love that endures even the most cantankerous, that's a fun word, cantankerous opposition and a self-discipline that can use restraints and oppose indulgences. That's exactly what Cody would need. He would need one that could restrain Cody's mouth. All right? We know Cody to be one that's more truth than grace and not as comforting and encouraging and as nice. The only reason why I can be nice is because of the Holy Spirit. The only reason why we can be encouraging is because of the Holy Spirit. He says this love is so much a love that produces Ministry as a love that also conquers contempt and opposition by forgiveness and the refusal to seek revenge. It's not just enough for you to be a nice person. You know, we always hear people say, well, this is just the way I am. Well, we have the Holy Spirit within us that doesn't leave us just the way we are. It gives us a love that can go and put somebody else before us. They can allow us to forgive even the unforgivable in our minds. And it also gives us that power to not seek revenge. So this is not just simply a, hey, you need to go and love people. This is saying, hey, Timothy, I know who you are because I'm also that type of person. I'm a human. I'm sinful. But we have something so much greater within us. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that we can go out and love and have discipline and be on fire for the Lord. So verse 8 through 12, this is a, a fun uh, verse looking at. In the Greek, it's a 105-word sentence. And once we get into it, you're going to be going, wow, that is a, an amazing sentence to look at. You could read over this over and over and over again and spend many days in it, this one sentence. We're going to break it down, though, and go verse by verse. It says, verse 8 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. We're going to skip over the first one of do not be ashamed, the negative, but we're going to look at the, the positive here, join with me first. You've got somebody sitting in prison that's went through all types of suffering that your mentor, basically your father in the faith, that says, hey, now it's your time to join with me. You want me to join with you in this, the suffering and the the horrible life that you've went through since coming to faith in Christ? Absolutely. He says, because it's by the power of God that you're able to do that. Uh, not just anybody's going to be able to suffer for the things that we suffer for. But because of the power of God, 
you're going to be able to. And look at what this power of God does. It says, this is all for the sake of the gospel. If you look at verse 9, it says, Who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Now, I had to... This, like I said, this verse, this, or this sentence in Greek, verses 8 through 12, I had to look at, ask people questions about, and just so much of it is above, especially my understanding and comprehension. But when I had to ask Rob, I said, How has God called us according to His grace from all eternity past? Grace wasn't all of a sudden a thing that needed to to happen when we had the fall of man and sin entered the world. God had all the grace and everything planned out before all eternity. But Christ granted us the grace and the purpose even before all eternity. Now, every another commentary put this sentence here. It says this, Every word emphasizes the power which has been given to Christians. A power which has done what man could not do himself, which has acted out of love for man, which has destroyed his chief enemy and given him life, which therefore calls for some return and gives strength to face suffering and death. So it's all for the gospel. It's all for Jesus. But if we ever do anything worthwhile in this life, it's going to be from the power of God. Okay. The power of God, one, it saves us. Two, it's the one that calls us. Because it's not by our works, but it's by grace. And not only is it that, but it's all for His purposes. This life is for His purpose. It's not about us. It's all about Christ and for God's glory. And we get all of it through Jesus, as even as far back as Creator. Not just as Him as Savior, but it goes all the way back to eternity past. Now, in verse 10 it says, that's Creator Jesus. But here we get into Savior Jesus. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Something's been revealed. That means it's been there the whole time, but we haven't been able to see it, maybe. But now we see because we have Christ here with us. It says He abolished death and brought life to the immortality, to the light through the gospel. Now we have Christ, and we see what all Christ has done. We had the graces and the purpose from all eternity past, but what else has Christ done by coming and dying in our place? Well, He's abolished death. You say, but we all still die, Cody. No, we don't. This body goes into the ground, maybe, but our souls will remain forever. And here's the thing. Everybody's soul remains forever. It's not just Christians, okay? Christians have life, and they have it more abundantly. They have true life in Christ Jesus. We don't experience the sting of death, okay? It's gone away. If we're believers and our family are believers, there's no more sting for us because we're going to see them one day. It's just a parting of time. They finally went home, and we're just waiting to get there. So death for us should not be what it is for an unbeliever. Now, you said that they don't die. They don't. They will sit under the wrath of God for all eternity. Their souls, their very being, will be under the wrath of God for all eternity. So it's not like Christians get an extra life at death. No, if you don't place your hope and trust in Jesus Christ, you have life. Your soul will still remain, but it will remain under the wrath of God for all eternity. But Christ has brought life and 
light into this world. Verse 11. Paul sits here and gives him an example. From which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. Through the power of God, through what Jesus Christ has done, I'm now to proclaim that in every facet of my life. As a preacher, as an apostle, as a teacher, I'm sure he'd say even as a tent maker, my whole purpose is to proclaim Christ and Him crucified. And he gives Timothy here that this is the very reason in verse 12. He says, for this reason I also suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day. Now Paul says, yes, Christ died. And everybody looked on that as like, well, he must not be God if he died. But then he raises from the dead. So our Messiah, our Christ, our Savior, yes, hung on a tree, cursed. But yet he rose again. But Paul says, I'm not ashamed that our Savior went to the cross. Nor am I ashamed of my imprisonment because it's all been about Christ. I am more than willing to suffer for this cause. But notice why he's unashamed. He's unashamed because of the assurance of Christ. Because it is for in whom I have believed. Notice it's not in what I believe. Not, it's not in how I live my life now. It's simply in the fact that he can trust and believe in the person of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was and is the Lamb that is slain for the sins of the world. It's only because of Him that we have any hope of life and that we have any light in this world. It's Jesus in whom He trusts, and it's also Jesus who is able to protect. It says, He is able to protect what I have entrusted to Him until that day. Now, a lot of uh, commentaries uh, say different things about this, of what it is that He has entrusted to Christ. But a lot of them just come to the conclusion that it's everything that Paul is. It's his life. It's his salvation. It's the people that he has proclaimed the gospel to. It's the churches that he's set up. It's the, the, uh, the letters that he's written. He's entrusted everything to Jesus, to Christ, to God Almighty. Well, why? Because it's only Christ and God Almighty that can protect these things. We've seen all throughout history the attacks on Christians, the attacks on uh, the Word of God, and it still remains. His Word still remains today. Now, Going back to verse 8 right quick. I told you we were going to skip over the first one and go back to it here. The, the verb there to not be ashamed. Verse 8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord and of me his prisoner. So now you can see by what we've just went through why Paul is not ashamed. Because it's in the power of God through Jesus Christ that we have Salvation. And Paul doesn't care to go to his execution because of that. Because he understands the value of that treasure. Going back to the story, I think Hernando Cortez understood the value of the treasure. And once again, he was a conqueror. He understood it, but those other people wasn't so sure about it. Those of us that believe and trust in Jesus Christ, if you're trusting your soul to a man for all eternity, you know the value. You know what that treasure is worth. And if that treasure is worth you placing your hope and trust in Him, it should be worth you telling somebody about it. We have a great treasure that we've been entrusted. 
He says, do not be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus and don't be ashamed of the circumstances that have surrounded me, Paul. He says, hold to the faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. If you look at verse 13, it says, hold on to the example of sound words which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. He says, I probably told you a lot of things, but you hold to the ones that's got to do with faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Those are the ones that you always can stand on. Then he says in verse 15, or 14, I'm sorry. Protect. How are you going to be able to protect? It's going to be through the Holy Spirit which dwells within us. This that I've told you, and this that we have in the Word of God, you better protect it. Because it is the treasure in which has been entrusted to you. So Paul says, I'm giving you these, these letters. I'm giving you this information on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you better protect it. Which doesn't mean that you take it and you lock it and you put it in your little chest and put it in your house. No, you better hold to the truth of it. As the body of Christ and the church, Timothy says we are to be the pillar and buttress of truth. We hold to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why we proclaim it is, is under no other name in which man may be saved. But what about no? Well, what about I believe? No. It is only under Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's very close-minded, yes. Because it is the Word of God, and we are protected. But remember, it is not simply something that we take and we put in a safe. We also protect it by proclaiming it. And why wouldn't we? Look at all that we had. If you go back to verse 9, He saved us. He's called us with a holy calling. We are to be different, each and every one of us. This is not simply to Timothy, the preacher and the teacher. He has all called us and set us apart from the world. And it's all for His purpose and grace that we've been granted in Christ Jesus. It's all a gift. There's nothing that you've done. There's no way that you can go out and share the gospel and boast of yourself. Because there's nothing about you. It's all through Jesus Christ and our God. So, I want to challenge you. Maybe like Hernando Cortez did those people. We do have the greatest treasure. We don't have to go out and fight for it. It was given to us Amen. on a cross. And we are to protect it? Yes. You share Christ and Christ alone. That's it. 